So I'm very happy to uh, start off the webinar series again. Um, indicator organisms are something that my program has done a lot of research in and, and we've been involved in over the last 10 years or so, really doing um, some of the groundwork for uh, these organisms and dairy products and understanding their uses. So I'm excited to share some of this with you and I'm gonna present some research from our group today so I'm going to start right out with um, sort of some definitions that will be the framework for how I'm going to discuss indicators versus index organisms. So an indicator organism, and I'll, and I'll read the, the definition, and, and it's kind of um, important to distinguish between these, these two things, and I'll give you sort of the layman's terms as well. So an indicator organism is a marker whose presence relates to the general microbiological condition of the food or environment. For example, hygienic quality. So in other words, this is just an organism that when you find it in a product, it means something about the um, overall um, microbiological condition of that, that product. So in a, a good example is um, coliforms. So coliforms are used a lot in the US, excuse me, um, not so much in Europe. Um, I think you guys in Australia use them them still. So coliforms are a very traditional indicator organism. When you find them in a pasteurized product, you know that there's been some sort of post-processing contamination or um, less likely is a um, processing failure. So that's an indicator organism. It means something about the, the microbiological condition of the, the product or the environment. An index organism, in contrast, is a marker whose presence relates to the possible occurrence of an ecologically similar pathogen. So an indicator organism has absolutely nothing to do with whether there's a pathogen in the product or not. An index organism does. So in, uh, the classic example of an index organism is listeria species. So we use listeria species as an index for listeria monocytogenes, which is a pathogen. So if we find listeria species, um, let's say in a, an environment, we understand that listeria monocytogenes could potentially live in that environment as well because they're similar enough um, to, the listeria species is similar enough to that pathogen um, that it can live in the same environment. And therefore we have to take some sort of step to um, reduce the hazard from um, that pathogen. But I just wanted to make sure we're all on the same page about this because this is actually something that's um, received a lot of attention in, in recent years, the difference between indicators and index. And sometimes people use the word indicator to discuss the potential for a pathogen. Um, in the product, and, and we're not going to do that at all today. Indicator simply means a, um, a marker that relates to the, the condition of the food or environment, and in this case, particularly the food. So again, indicator organisms can't be used as index organisms. We're not going to um, discuss, you know, the, um, these in context of a pathogen. So indicator organisms have been around for a really long time. I mentioned coliforms, and those are sort of the traditional um, indicator organisms, and they were used since the mid to late 19th century um, as indicators of fecal contamination in drinking water. And this really um, was a huge benefit to the, to the public health um, and to the food and uh, water industries over the last um, century because they're um, very good um, at, oh, very good at quickly um, allowing for Jenny I'm sorry we can we can hear you on your side so the the dairy industry adopted coliforms um, in the US as indicators of unsanitary processing conditions. Um, as early as the 1920s, it showed up in our um, pasteurized, the earliest forms of our pasteurized milk ordinance. Um, 
as an indicator of unsanitary conditions. So nearly, nearly a full century ago. Um, the methodology for detecting these organisms has evolved uh, tremendously since they um, began being used in the 19th century. Um, and what we know now from advances in taxonomy using molecular methodology, so actually being able to look at how um, coliforms are related to each other and related to other groups of organisms, um, has allowed us to really understand how diverse um, this group is and, and calls into question how useful coliforms are as indicator organisms. And I'll um, discuss why um, a little more as we go through. So again, coliforms are hygiene and sanitation indicators um, traditionally in the dairy industry. They're aerobic and facultatively anaerobic, gram-negative, non-spore-forming rods, and they're capable of fermenting lactose to produce gas and acid within 48 hours um, at 32 to 37 degrees C. And this kind of seems um, overly uh, detailed to, to talk about this, but because coliforms are um, a method defined group, meaning that there is no um, taxonomy that defines coliforms. We can't just say that it's everything within um, a certain family or everything within a certain genus of bacteria that falls into coliforms. Um, we have to use this very specific method to determine what is a coliform and what is not. Now, most of the coliforms are within the Enterobacteriaceae family. So there are 19 genera um, currently described in literature that fall within um, the coliform methodology as being positive. The real trick with coliforms is that even within a, a specific genus, so within Citrobacter, there may be the um, species or strains of bacteria that are able to ferment lactose to produce gas and acid under these conditions, and there may be strains that are not capable of doing that. So within one, um, you know, very closely related group of, of bacteria, you may have some that are coliforms and some that are not coliforms. And again, this has really um, introduced some um, controversy into the usefulness of coliforms, but also into the, you know, actual practicality of using coliforms when you have these closely related organisms that don't behave um, similarly to each other. Um, in the U.S., coliform testing is required by our pasteurized milk ordinance, which is the document that governs our um, dairy industry and, and the requirements that we have for testing. So for fluid milk and other grade A pasteurized products, um, coliforms have to uh, be at or below 10 CFU per mil or gram. Um, and that's also something that's been discussed pretty vigorously in the last couple of years, the usefulness of, of um, using coliforms in that manner. Um, and we'll continue to discuss that. So another large um, sort of main group of indicator organisms are Enterobacteriaceae. And so I mentioned this on the previous slide because many coliforms fall within um, the Enterobacteriaceae family. These are um, very similar to um, coliforms in that they're gram-negative, they're facultatively and anaerobic, they're non-spore forming rob, rods. Um, the difference is these organisms ferment glucose as opposed to lactose and they produce gas and or acid. So, um, so it's similar, but again, these are a taxonomic group. So these are um, everything that falls within this family of bacteria um, are Enterobacteriaceae. And these organisms are typically um, used in Europe. They're starting to catch on a little bit more here in the U.S. for use as indicator organisms, um, but it's still kind of slow going as that's concerned. Total gram negatives are um, what um, we are sort of working toward using in, in some ways, and we'll discuss that further. But so this is a whole um, group of 
um, bacteria that are gram negative. And so bacteria can be categorized as either gram negative or gram positive based on the makeup of their cell wall. And gram negative bacteria are typically very heat labile, meaning that um, they're very easily um, killed by pasteurization and, and other processing techniques. And so their presence um, in um, a fluid milk, for instance, would signal a hygiene or san sanitation breakdown. Um, and currently, um, these uh, the methods that we have for total gram negatives are not as advanced as what we have for coliforms and EB, simply because they haven't been used uh, traditionally as um, indicator organisms. And I'll, I'll make the case why I think that, that that should change. And one of the things that would have to change in order for gram negatives to be used widely as indicator organisms is the methods um, that we use would have to, to become more rapid um, and more automated in order to make them a um, sort of on par with what's currently used for coliforms and, and EB in the dairy industry. E. coli is also um, a very common indicator organism. So this is a thermotolerant coliform. It falls within the coliform group um, in that it can um, grow and ferment lactose, um, but it it can do this at a higher temperature. So we call it a thermotolerant coliform. So instead of at 32 or 35 degrees C, um, E. coli can grow at 44 to 45 degrees C. And so this has been traditionally the only member of the coliform group that can really be used as an indicator of fecal contamination because um, it is a, um, an organism that typically can only grow and only survive um, within the um, intestinal tract of warm-blooded animals. We know now that that's not actually true of all E. coli strains. There are some that can survive very well in um, natural environments with, um, without an association to fecal contamination. So um, we, we don't have any absolutes um, in this, in this uh, regard for indicator organisms. So um, it is still traditionally used in a lot of ways as an indicator organism, but it can't reliably um, be used solely as an indicator of fecal contamination. Um, although many E. coli do, um, do come from those sources. So if we kind of take a step back and look at the big picture of all of these um, indicators, we can um, sort of clump them into different um, groups and let me grab my pointer here. So we have um, gram negative bacteria. That's sort of the um, umbrella um, group of bacteria that all of these things fall within. And again, these are um, used, not just gram negative bacteria, but all of these are used as indicators of process failure and of post processing contamination because they're easily killed by pasteurization. And so within gram-negative bacteria, the um, Enterobacteriaceae family falls. And then within the Enterobacteriaceae family, primarily um, the coliform group falls and E. coli is inside there. So we have um, sort of these different options for indicator organisms. And then I have this um, sort of off-centered here because Aeromonas, um, which is not a uh, in, in the Enterobacteriaceae family, some strains can produce a positive coliform reaction. And since we look at coliforms as a method-defined group of organisms, although we know that um, Aeromonas is not within our Enterobacteriaceae, and that may be the traditional um, definition of coliforms, if a dairy plant were to have um, a strain of Aeromonas in a milk sample and played it on a petri film, they would get a positive result from um, that, that organism. So we're going to call it a, a coliform just from a practicality standpoint, although that, that can be um, debated a little bit. But that falls with outside of Enterobacteriaceae um, within the, the larger gram-negative bacteria group. So some of the um, 
methods that we use for detecting indicator organisms. These are just a couple. Um, petri films are used a lot for these um, indicator organisms, specifically for coliform count for Enterobacteriaceae count. The crystal violet tetrazoleum agar is the uh, method that is used for total gram negatives, and there is no um, petri film option for that. There's there's really not many options um, for total gram negative counts, which which is one of the downfalls of that that method at this point. So coliform count petri film, um, they're very rapid, 24 hours or less. There are some options for a for a faster turnaround time. They're very convenient. Um, they detect, they very reliably detect only coliforms. Um, and again, coliforms are required by the PMO. So um, this is something, at least in the US and, and in a few other places, um, that's being done a lot. The Enterobacteriaceae petri film, again, um, this method is very fast. It's very convenient. Um, and it very reliably only detects Enterobacteriaceae. And so this is a picture of a crystal violet tetrazoleum or CVTA plate. This method um, is less rapid, so it takes a full 48 hours um, for this, for the organisms to grow on this media. Um, it's definitely less convenient because it's not a dehydrated um, film type um, method. You have to actually have petri dishes and, and um, auger. Um, and this method does detect almost all gram-negative um, organisms. We have done some work with this media and found that there are a few strains um, of gram-negative bacteria that don't grow well on this, um, but overall it, it detects most. So these are, um, so this is not an ex exhaustive list of the methods that can be used, but they're the ones that um, are very frequently used. There are also a few rapid um, options, more automated systems for detecting um, coliforms, EB, and gram negatives. Here, these are just a couple of the systems um, I've personally worked with, but there are a few others that are out there for, um, for more rapidly detecting these organism, these indicator organisms. So a few more indicator organisms to be aware of, enterococci, um, these can be used for hygiene and sanitation indicators and fermented dairy products like yogurt. Um, they're gram-positive cocci, they're facultatively anaerobic, and they're tolerant of a wide range of environmental conditions. So they can survive in a yogurt product where um, maybe a coliform or a pseudomonas would not be able to, which is one of the reasons that it um, has been suggested as a um, sort of a replacement for the, for coliforms in yogurt uh, products. But there really is very little research currently to support the use of enterococci in cultured dairy products. Um, the research that is out there kind of has mixed um, feelings about, about the use of enterococci. They don't um, occur naturally in the product very often. So there are very low incidence of enterococci in yogurt products. And so um, one of the, the things that we need when we're looking for a good indicator is that it actually um, shows up in the product when there's a process failure or if there's a contamination issue. So um, it's been suggested that it, it's not a good indicator organism because of because of that reason. They can also, um, some of the methods that are used for enterococci um, can be hard to interpret in a cultured product because um, you can get background noise from some of the lactics that are in there, um, lactobacillus and um, streptococcus that are in the um, cultured product. So there's some concern as far as using enterococci as an indicator because of that as well in cultured products. Finally, yeast and mold can be used as a um, indicator of uh, processing failure or contamination post-processing. Again, um, they're particularly useful in cultured products because fungi 
can survive uh, much better than bacteria in yogurt and other cultured um, high acid products. So um, the problem we have with yeast and mold is that they typically grow a lot slower than bacteria and so it can take a long time to get a result. Um, there are some rapid methods out there. Petrifilm has a, a rapid method and um, some of, I think Chemonex BioMuro has a, um, a platform for fungal contamination that takes less time. So, so there's definitely some options out there um, for use of, of yeast and mold in a, in a faster context. And then finally aerobic plate counts which can be used um, but but typically only when we're looking at a um, sterile product because any um, you know conventionally pasteurized product is going to have some organisms that survive pasteurization like gram positive um, spore forming bacteria and other uh, more heat resistant gram positive cocci so it wouldn't be surprising to have a low level of um, total um, bacteria counts in a lot of those products but in a UHT product for instance um, this could could be used as as an indicator that there was um, some unsanitary condition or some process failure. So our overall goal for using indicator organisms um, is really to quickly identify lapses in um, cleaning and sanitation, GMPs, preventative maintenance, um, all of these things in order to resolve the issues um, rapidly and prevent further contamination or further process failure um, that would compromise the quality of the product. Um, and so we're really want to have that in mind when we're looking at um, indicator organisms and, and how we select them and how we use them. So I have a couple of examples of um, contamination and um, areas where or issues that um, could be detected by um, carefully selected indicator organisms before they get to the consumer. So the first one here is a um, HTST uh, fluid milk that is contaminated with Pseudomonas. And this particular strain of Pseudomonas um, creates a very um, distinct gray, um, gray black color. And you can see it here around the, the rim of the container. And so this is a contamination um, that we've seen uh, multiple times, but for a consumer to get this product, it's pretty alarming. Um, and a total gram negative test done on this product would pick up um, issues such as these so that the, the processor could deal with that and eliminate that contamination before the, the consumer gets it. The second example I have here is um, ropey milk, which um, used to be a bigger issue than it currently is, but we still see it in pasteurized fluid milk occasionally. This is caused by um, a couple of different organisms, um, notably Ranella and Klebsiella, both coliforms. And um, there's some indication that this can be caused by um, other gram negatives as well, specifically Pseudomonas. And so um, it's actually a video and I'll see if I can get it to Sorry. Play. So you can see that um, it has this very characteristic ropey defect um, that is pretty, pretty disgusting and um, you know, a consumer using a product like this would definitely impact their um, willingness to, to buy that product again. And so we definitely don't want to see issues like that in, um, in our fluid milk supply. But again, it does show up every once in a while. Um, again, gram negative testing would catch that problem. Um, using gram negatives as an indicator organism, that specific one would be caught with coliforms as well. 
And then we have one of my favorite um, contaminations, which is a um, Pseudomonas fluorescens in a, a low acid cheese. This specific organism produces um, two different pigments, one that's blue and one that's um, fluorescent. And you can see pictures of both of those pigments here um, on this product. So these, um, this specific strain came from an incident um, here in the US, but we've seen this um, contamination in other cheese products in Europe before a couple of years ago. Um, there was a massive contamination of mozzarella that was um, produced in Germany and sent to Italy. And this um, contamination happened and um, there was a huge investigation. I think Italy stopped um, importing mozzarella from Germany for a while because of it, because they thought it, it could be a chemical um, contamination, but it turns out it's just Pseudomonas. And again, um, total gram negative testing would catch this, this particular um, type of contamination um, so that it could be addressed. So there's a few hallmarks of appropriate indicator organisms, and, and there are some other groups that have lists of, um, you know, what what you should look for when selecting an indicator organism. But these are sort of my um, my big ones that I would be um, looking for. First and foremost, that that the organism that you're looking for survives in the product, and and of course this is the reason that enterococci have been suggested for yogurt products because. Um, uh, the convention is that coliforms don't survive in the product. Um, we'll look at some data about that in a few minutes. The tests for this indicator organism should be rapid, so they should at least be faster than doing um, a traditional um, shelf life test, and and that's saying a lot. But but typically we want something that's like 24 hours or or even less um, time to result. They should be easy to test for. The methods should not be cumbersome. They should not have a ton of steps. It should not be um, easy to mess up. Um, and the methods should be validated for the specific product in, um, that, that it's being used for. And then they should be accurate. So they should have um, low false negative and false positive rates. They should be um, applicable to the process um, and process control. So we're going to take a look at a couple of examples of um, indicator organisms and their use in different dairy products. The first is in um, fluid milk. So in my program we, we um, have a very long-standing project where we look at quality trends in conventionally high temperature short time pasteurized fluid milk. And this is some data from that program. Um, that's been ongoing since the 1970s um, here in the U.S. And essentially what you're looking at is um, three different categories of, of processing facilities that we work with, Tier 1 through Tier 3. Tier 1 are our um, processors who typically have very good quality. They, they're very consistent. Um, tier 3 are our processors that um, tend to have um, challenges with quality and tier two are the processors who sort of fall somewhere in between and we um, break them down into these tiers so that we can better um, target intervention strategies and troubleshooting for these specific processors and a few years ago we looked at um, the total populations of bacteria in the product um, at the end of shelf life. And we did this using molecular methodology. So we actually um, looked at the DNA that we found in the organisms and were identified it down to species level. So we were able to very um, accurately determine whether the product had been spoiled because of a gram negative bacteria or a gram positive bacteria. And just as a reminder, gram negative bacteria should be killed by pasteurization. So um, and, and um, gram-positive bacteria are typically um, gram-positive spore formers that are entering into the product at the farm and surviving pasteurization. So we have two different types of spoilage here. Um, so if we look just at our gram-negative spoilage, what you can see is that um, in our tier three plants, over 80% of the product that we assess was spoiled by gram-negative bacteria. This isn't surprising. These these processors have quality issues, and it's for this reason they have trouble um, with post-processing contamination. 
Um, in contrast, our tier one plants, what we found is that um, about a third of, of the samples that they that we had assessed were spoiled by gram negative bacteria. And this was a little bit surprising to us because um, when we looked just at coliform contamination in these samples, they had less than 10% incidence of coliforms. And so there's a huge disparity between um, how many samples showed evidence of contamination post-processing and how many samples showed evidence of coliform contamination. And so we started looking a lot more closely at um, the ecology, so the, the types of organisms that we found in fluid milk. And um, what we found was that Pseudomonas accounts for um, 41%, over 40% of the spoilage in um, fluid milk. And over the last few years, we've looked at this in, in a few different ways, and, and we consistently find that 40 to 60% of fluid milk is spoiled by just Pseudomonas itself. Um, coliforms, so um, would all fall in this other category, so, but this also includes things like Micrococcus and other organisms that um, show up fairly rarely, so about 10% um, of the microbial ecology of pasteurized fluid milk turns out to be coliforms. And then the remainder are gram-positive organisms, penibacillus and bacillus, um, that can spoil fluid milk um, over longer shelf life, usually around 21 days. Um, but this, this is fairly concerning to us because the traditional indicator that's used in the dairy industry is coliforms, and Pseudomonas is not a coliform. Pseudomonas is not in the Enterobacteriaceae family, so it's not AB either. It is um, a gram-negative, however, and so the traditional testing that's happening in the dairy industry is never going to detect Pseudomonas. And if we um, keep in mind our goal of, of rapidly responding to um, process failures and um, contamination, post-processing contamination events, then um, if all we're doing is cold form testing, we're never going to find the majority of um, the contamination that's happening after pasteurization. So if we look at the different types of media and what organisms um, are um, detected using those media, media um, we break it down by standard plate count, which is total, total count, um, crystal violet tetrazoleum, which is the media that's used for total gram negatives, um, the EB and the coliform media. What you can see is that we go from a very diverse group of organisms in this um, category, so the total bacteria count um, agar catches everything um, from gram positive spore formers to pseudomonas to lactics, and that's all captured here um, in, this, in this bar. This big um, green section here is um, representative of pseudomonas. The total gram negative media captures the pseudomonas as well as a bunch of um, other gram negatives and um, Enterobacteriaceae and coliforms, so that um, is really looking at everything except those gram positives, which is exactly what we want. Um, as we go further over EB and coliform, um, you see a huge reduction in the number of different organisms that are um, detected using these media, and that's exactly why we see that um, a group of plants that has less than 10% coliform contamination can actually have still have a greater than 30% incidence of post-processing contamination just based on which indicator organism you're looking at um, to detect that kind of um, contamination event. A couple of um, slides just to show you um, the difference between um, these different indicators when we look at um, shelf life. So this is a graph of a coliform count this was a stressed um, sample versus the final day of shelf life um, of the product held at refrigeration temperature. And we looked at samples that had evidence of post-processing contamination. So PPC, these red boxes, 
um, samples that had evidence of spore formers. Those are these little green triangles. And then everything that fell below spoilage level at the end of shelf life are these blue ones. And I'm using um, for log 4.3, which is 20,000 CFU per mil, which is our PMO limit um, for pasteurized fluid milk. And so when we just use coliforms as an indicator, we only have a sensitivity of 20%, specificity of 99%. So this basically means that we have a whole lot of false negatives um, in when we use coliform counts. There's a lot of samples that ended up um, being spoiled by gram-negative bacteria that were just never detected using this test. And those are all these red um, squares over here on this axis. Um, that were not detected. So we have a really bad sensitivity for this test. It was um, less than 30 hours until um, time to test for that. So it was still a reasonable, reasonably rapid, um, but, but not accurate at all. If we look at um, the CBTA counts, this is also a stressed um, sample and then played it on CBTA versus final day of shelf life. Um, total bacteria count, you can see that that sensitivity has gone up to 69%. So it's still not perfect, um, but we capture a whole lot more of these samples that have post-processing contamination, and we do it in um, less than 66 hours, so typically about 48 hours, um, but it can take a little bit longer with this, with this test method. So there's a lot of work to be done here in the methodology in order to improve the rapidity um, of this total gram negative um, indicator. But as far as um, how accurate it is for the industry, this really is um, the best that, that we've seen and that uh, seems to be currently available to the industry. And so if we kind of just break this down by our criteria for a good um, indicator organisms, you can see that coliforms, although they survive in the product and they have rapid testing um, and they're easy to test, we know that they're not very accurate for determining if there's been a um, uh, contamination event or a um, process um, failure. Same thing with Enterobacteria ACA. While total gram-negative bacteria um, survive in the product, they're not incredibly rapid, but they're much um, faster than uh, Mosley keeping quality test, which is sort of the very traditional um, test that can be used to determine shelf life of fluid milk. That can take um, 10 days. So in, re in relation to that, this is, is faster. Um, it's fairly easy to test, although it does require more um, labor and input um, to test for. This could be very easily um, developed, these methods could be, um, to make this an easier indicator to test for. Um, and, it's, and it's fairly accurate, so we, we find most of the contamination um, that happens in the product with total gram negatives. All right, so we'll switch gears a little bit and look at Greek yogurt. So again, coliforms and EB um, are typically used right now as indicators. Um, although enterococci have been um, suggested as alternatives, uh, although they're infrequent contaminants of yogurt products, so, um, so that, that causes a problem. Many other spoilage bacteria don't survive um, in the pHs found in the yogurt environment, which is certainly a challenge for um, finding an appropriate indicator organism for that product. This is based primarily on studies that have been done with um, select strains of, of coliforms and um, um, other gram-negative bacteria. So, so this is an area that we have been particularly interested in looking at um, and doing research with. And so um, we just published a study that looked at different organisms, different indicator organisms and their ability to survive in a yogurt product. And what we found when we looked at this is, um, well, first of all, uh, we looked at a variety of different coliforms. So here are all the different um, genera of coliforms that we tested. We looked at non-coliform EB, so these ones here, and we looked at non-EB gram negatives, so um, Pseudomonas, Aeromonas, and Acinetobacter. And we looked at how 
um, much they either grew or died over storage in yogurt. And um, here, this line here is um, sort of if there was no growth or no death during that time, um, that's zero. So above would be growth, below would be death. And um, the first thing to know is that the non-EB gram negatives like pseudomonas are definitely not good indicators in um, a yogurt product. They decline pretty rapidly at that pH. Um, and so the, the ability to survive in the product is certainly something we're interested in. So that one's not going to work. Um, in contrast, the, the coliforms and the non-coliform EB, depending on the strain, actually did fairly well. So um, they were able to mostly either survive, some of them were able to grow, some of them did, did decline a little bit, but because these organisms um, are found more frequently than enterococci, um, this is actually a fairly um, positive result that we can use EB in general, which would capture all of these different organisms as an indicator in yogurt, um, as opposed to, to just the coliform group or to enterococci um, in this particular case. And so again, if we, we sort of break it down um, for yogurt, coliforms, strain dependent, um, but can survive in the product and um, and sometimes even grow in the product. It's still rapid, easy to test, and um, fairly accurate. Same thing with Enterobacteriaceae. Um, in this case, total gram-negative bacteria are not um, a good choice because they don't survive well in the product um, and therefore not um, accurate um, identifiers of, of process issues. And Enterococci survive in the product um, but because they have a fairly low incidence, they're not very accurate for detecting um, these types of quality issues. Um, and again, some of the, the methods um, aren't quite as developed, and so they're not as easy or rapid. Um, and there's some interpretation issues because of the ability of other lactics to grow in, um, in those tests. So in cheese, it's a little more complex. Um, again, coliforms and EB are used um, for indicators a lot of the time in cheese products, and, and they typically have regulatory limits here in the US. Um, we have coliform limits for um, cheese products. Some cheese products, though, um, in particular natural rind cheeses um, and some washed rind cheeses, um, have coliforms as a beneficial part of their microflora. And so um, these using these coliforms as an indicator organism poses a challenge because these organisms are actually um, meant to be there. And in fact, there are some cultures that have been developed that um, are in the coliform group and have been developed for certain cheese applications. So to develop certain um, uh, flavors, flavor profiles because of the uh, proteolysis that they provide to that, to that product. Um, what we see is that, that because of the, the huge diversity in the types of cheeses um, that are out there and their characteristics, like their pH and their water activity and their salt content, um, that's what really determines the ability of coliforms and EB to survive or grow in those products. This is a um, really great graph from um, a paper published by Ben Wolf and um, Rachel Dutton um, when they were at Harvard. And it just is, is showing us the different um, organisms that, that they find in um, cheese products. And so um, what they found is that certain coliforms, in this case it was Hafnia and Serratia, um, can be found in a variety of different types of cheeses, and, and that's very um, normal and expected, and they contribute to the characteristics of that cheese. And so this definitely causes, um, you know, some concern about um, using these organisms as, as indicator organisms because the, the microflora is supposed to be that way. So in some cheese products, EB um, and E. coli may actually be appropriate. So there are fresh cheeses that um, we wouldn't expect to see these organisms in. Um, certainly in processed cheese products, there uh, 
we could make a case for using these organisms as, as indicators. Um, there's definitely a need for more research in this area because there isn't a whole lot of data um, out there for us to base these um, determinations on. For aged cheese products, they um, typically have much more diverse um, ecology, so they, they typically have a lot more um, diversity in the types of bacteria that are there and the types of fungi. And so what we know is that there's no association between the presence of coliforms and any relevant pathogens. And, and you may not be surprised about that because coliforms are an indicator and we know that indicator organisms have nothing to do with pathogen contamination, but sometimes that's confusing um, and has definitely been confused in the industry. And so Listeria monocytogenes, um, which is one of the most relevant pathogens in cheese, um, is not associated with coliforms at all and instead is associated with its own set of cheese characteristics like pH and, and water activity. And the current research that's been done in our group and in other groups um, suggests that um, targeted risk-based pathogen testing in aged cheese is the best way to go instead of using coliform testing or EB testing at all for um, as indicators because of these diverse populations that we find um, in these in these cheese products. This is a graph um, from a, a project that we recently um, published out of our group just looking at, at what types of characteristics um, we are associated with listeria contamination and what types of characteristics are um, associated with um, coal form contamination. And I'm actually going to kind of skip over this. If you want to look at it um, and have any questions, just email me and I can send you a copy of that, um, that paper if, if you're interested, just um, in um, interest of getting um, of, of time. So we certainly um, have to rethink indicator organisms um, in the dairy industry because the traditional ways of, of using indicator organisms, as wonderful as they've been um, in the context of the technology that we had and um, the methods that we've had, we, we have better technology, we have better methods, we have better data now to um, to help us use indicators in a better way. And so um, as we move forward in the industry, um, we've made some suggestions in a, in a recent publication that we put out. Um, and I just leave this here with you and you can look at it um, at your leisure. But essentially what we're advocating for is a, a more data-driven um, selection of different indicators. And so some of the ones that, that I spoke about today are, are included here. So for fluid milk, we would propose that total gram negative bacteria is a better indicator um, for hygienic issues than coliforms, which are, are the traditional indicator. And that's because coliforms don't detect the majority of contamination. And um, if we are interested in, in rapidly responding to contamination events, total gram negatives are going to be um, the better way to go. We, we examine fermented dairy products um, and their enterobacteriaceae seems to be the way to go. And then for aged and fresh cheeses, there are also some other products we can talk about, dairy powders, ice cream, butter. There isn't a lot of research in these areas and, and that's definitely something that, that needs to be addressed in the dairy industry so that that we can develop a better understanding of, of the best indicators in, in these areas. So there are a few challenges um, to testing for indicator organisms. The first being that, that contamination um, often occurs sporadically and at low levels. And so if you have a very low level of pseudomonas in your, your fluid milk, um, the chance that you're able to detect it with a, um, a traditional um, micro test uh, isn't that great. And so there may be um, the necessity to have some sort of a selective enrichment or an amplification in order to detect that contamination. And even then, if we're looking at levels of, um, you know, one organism per, um, you know, liter of milk or, or something along those lines, it's just going to be very challenging to detect that until that contamination becomes 
um, more um, more con um, condensed. And then, as I mentioned, currently research on appropriate indicator organisms in um, various products is, is certainly lacking. Coliforms and EB have sort of been sort of the, the underlying um, backup option for use, but, but that's certainly not going to be the best option in a lot of cases, and, and we need some data to, to help inform those decisions. So just a, a quick summary in my last couple of minutes, indicator organisms are markers whose presence relates to the general microbiological condition of the food or environment. Again, I think it's really important to have a, a good framework for um, how we use that word in these terms so that, that we know that this is about um, hygiene and, and sanitation as opposed to um, talking about pathogens. So we know that if we have a cold form in our food milk, it doesn't mean that we, um, you know, it doesn't mean anything about the, uh, the possibility of a um, pathogen being in that product. Um, appropriate select, appropriately selected indicator organisms are very meaningful and allow processors to rapidly respond to lapses in GMPs or process failures. And that's so important um, in um, determining which indicator organism is, is going to be the best option. And um, coliforms, although they have a very long history in the dairy industry, are certainly not the best choice in, in many products, and um, fluid milk is the one that, that I would um, point out as the, um, as the main culprit there. And, you know, in the U.S., we have um, regulations still for coliforms and fluid milk, and I would say um, it certainly we need to continue to use it from a regulatory standpoint until there's some movement for change there, but there's no reason that processors can't also be doing total gram negative testing um, on their own as a process control in their, in their facilities. And with that, I'd take any questions that may have come up over um, the webinar. And then again, um, if you think of anything or if you want any of these references, please just um, email me um, or contact me in that way. Okay, so now if you have any questions, you're welcome to um, open up your chat box, which will be on the bar at the bottom of your page. Um, just hover your mouse down there and open your chat box. Um, and just <coughs> thanks so much, Nicole. That's been really good. Um, hopefully we've got a few questions that are going to happen. Now, um, just a reminder, you did refer to some work by Ben and Rachel. Um, yes. They've now gone to different universities and Rachel's in um, San Diego and Ben's up at Tufts University and they're both going to be doing webinars for us this semester. So that'll be That's fantastic. That's great. Yeah. Um, right. So should I, should I stop my um, screen share and... Give no, it back to you. that's all right. No, okay. no that's okay. Um, now, what um, we can't with this system, we can't tell if people are typing in questions. So it would be really good if we get a few questions that would follow up on that. Um, and the other thing I would like people to do is to type in how many people they are watching this webinar with so that we can um, work out numbers that we've had watching today. So, Nicole, if you read out the question first. Sure. So, Alice asks um, about... Uh, my views on using ATP in the environmental monitoring for indicator organisms um, because I focused primarily on the finished product and not in the environment. And that's a great question that you're, you have, Alice. So um, ATP is a great tool um, to use in the processing facility because it's so fast, it's so easy to use, um, and it, it really gives a good um, indication of whether um, cleaning and sanitation has done what it's supposed to be doing. Um, the, the challenge with ATP testing is um, typically the areas that we're going to have contamination um, from 
are not easily accessible using ATP testing in environmental monitoring. And I'm a huge proponent of environmental monitoring. I think it's absolutely necessary. Um, but it's sort of a balance between, between both. If you want something really quick um, to assess overall um, functioning of cleaning and sanitation, ATP is absolutely a great tool to use. Uh, we also do a lot of, um, a lot of uh, testing for things like yeast and mold in the environment, right? We look at air quality um, for yeast and mold um, as an indicator of, of um, how our um, air systems are working and that kind of thing. So, so absolutely a, a, good, um, a good thing to, to use. Okay, we've just had Kim join us. Um, Kim, I know you haven't heard the webinar, but if you happen to have any um, questions, we're answering questions now. And the recording will be available soon after the webinar, like five minutes after the webinar, you'll be able to click on the same link and um, watch the recording. So Alice has got another question there for you. Yeah. So Alice's um, follow-up question is, what are the future steps in the research that we're doing? And then um, do we have sufficient support from the industry? And I'd say that um, we have a lot of support from the dairy industry in the U.S. Um, they are very eager to use tools that have um, app, um, that are applicable to their process. And so once um, they learn that, you know, specifically coliforms may not be um, the best tool to use for determining, um, you know, if there's been some sort of a process failure or, um, or contamination, then they're really interested in, um, in moving to different tools. The regulatory side is a little slower. Um, and so in that way, you know, we, we continue to provide data in order to support our positions there. Um, We'll continue to work on different products and looking at different um, methods for, for those products and with what would um, constitute appropriate indicator organisms in those products. Like I said, there's not a lot of work done um, in dairy powders and in aged cheeses. So, so that's something that we'll continue to look at. And then um, there's another, another question. Um, in the U.S., coal form is used. In the EU, it tends to be EB. Um, what about for um, environmental monitoring in cheese facilities? So for environmental monitoring, um, I'm typically going to recommend that uh, we focus on pathogen monitoring for the environment, so listeria, um, potentially salmonella, depending on what product you have. Um, and then, you know, certainly using things like um, ATP and yeast and mold as sort of hygiene indicators um, for the environment, depending on what product you're, you're, um, you're making. And so, again, it's, it's a little more complex because everything in cheese depends on the characteristics of your specific product. What are the, what's the pH? What's the water activity? What's the salt level? Um, those things are all going to de determine which um, pathogens you should be testing for and, um, and what indicators you might be using in your environment. So if you, know, if you have a susceptible product um, to yeast and mold, whether that's something that you should be doing or whether you should you know, just be focusing on ETP as a um, hygiene indicator. So, so there's no straightforward answer for cheese, unfortunately, and, and that's one of the reasons that um, so much research is needed to inform those decisions.